All right. Well, this is the first in a new ASNIC interview series with thought leaders in the field. And we'll be having a, a number of these uh, different interviews with uh, key leaders on topics that we hope are very interesting to uh, nuclear cardiologists and certainly members of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Uh, we're privileged to have uh, Dr. Robert Bono today. Uh, Dr. Bono is the Goldberg Distinguished Professor of Cardiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. In addition to being a founding member of ASNIC, he currently serves as editor-in-chief of JAMA Cardiology and is one of the editors of Bronwald's Heart Disease. Among his many accolades, he's a past president of the American Heart Association and master of the ACC and ACP, and has been a mentor to countless trainees and attending physicians, uh, including myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthew Herrenstein. I'm a cardiologist at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. I'm the senior vice president at UPMC International and associate professor of medicine. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Shadi. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Bono. This is um, Shadi Abu Hashim. I'm um, uh, an investigator in cardiovascular imaging at Mass General Hospital and uh, an instructor in radiology at uh, uh, Harvard Medical School. I'm also a uh, uh, MBH candidate at Harvard University and um, uh, as the LDB member and future leader program. It's a pleasure Great. to be you here today. Well, thank you. So, Dr. Bono, welcome to the interview. Thank you very much, uh, Matt uh, and Shadi. Delighted to be with you. Uh, look forward to uh, an interesting discussion. So I wanted to start off with, uh, you know, sort of just a, a broad overview and um, ask you, you know, nuclear cardiology has evolved since the establishment of ASNIC now more than 25 years ago. What are your thoughts on, you know, current diagnostic role for nuclear cardiology for patients with cardiac disease? Well, thanks, Matt. You know, this is a... Um, uh, uh, kind of an open question and uh, one that's evolving and has uh, lots of really local issues as to uh, where nuclear cardiology fits in um, at any given institution. It really depends upon the leadership at the institution, that is the nuclear cardiology leadership and uh, how well uh, leadership is integrated into the clinical uh, uh, coming and going of the, the other uh, colleagues at that institution and the quality of the uh, product that's created there. Um, you know, since the founding of ASNIC, uh, nuclear cardiology has just been uh, exploding in multiple different directions. Um, I started with uh, uh, gated blood pool imaging and the uh, planar thallium perfusion imaging. So, you know, that's uh, ancient history as to uh, what we used to do versus what we can perform now with, uh, you know, PET and multiple modality imaging, as well as uh, advanced spec imaging. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it, it really depends upon uh, how well the um, individuals who are performing and interpreting and uh, uh, contributing to patient care at a given institution, uh, how well they are integrated into the mainstream of cardiology practice. So it's, it's highly variable across the country and across the world. Yeah, I, I agree. I think even in my short time in cardiology, I've seen, you know, periods where we, we come to our annual meetings and people are wondering, you know, what's the next step for us? And, you know, maybe, you know, stress testing and, and you know, uh, performing intervention is, is going down. So what's the next wave of the future? And then the next year, you know, we're all talking about uh, amyloid imaging and uh, uh, you know, technetium pyrophosphate imaging and so forth, and now PET imaging. And so, you know, it's, it's really been amazing in nuclear cardi cardiology, how we've uh, pivoted and grown really a lot of the different things that we're doing and the ability to, to make uh, diagnoses that we didn't, uh, we didn't make years ago with nuclear techniques has, has been great. Well, I think that's part of the, uh, part of the issue is, is how to stay current and how to come up with, uh, you know, new exciting ways of uh, providing the kind of uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, potential to go with the current trends in cardiology. And I think uh, nuclear uh, cardiology has been pretty facile at, at keeping up with things and also evolving the technology to do its, its own multimodality uh, imaging as well. So, you know, with, uh, with PET now, uh, in addition to perfusion imaging, we can be quantitative in terms of blood flow. We can get uh, in, uh, data regarding left ventricular, right ventricular function and also get CAC scoring. So, you know, we have a kind of a multimodality package uh, built into our current uh, framework of PET imaging. 
And that's really, actually, I'm, I'm now the, the chair of the education committee for ASNIC. And this has really been one of our focuses because as you just mentioned, I think one of the big things for nuclear cardiologists is how do you be current? You know, you see a lot of these new techniques coming in. And so how do you learn, you know, if you're post-training about amyloid imaging, about PET imaging and so forth. Yeah. And even if you have PET yeah. imaging, they, we continue to make new diagnoses all the time. Yeah. And, and I really want to uh, harken back to the, to the local leadership being so important. And I'll shout, give a shout out here to uh, Richard Weinberg, who uh, joined us um, a little over a year ago as our new uh, chair of uh, nuclear cardiology after Tom Holly departed. And Richard brought a whole new perspective for how we can do PET imaging that was uh, uh, new for us because uh, we, we had PET available, but we weren't really doing the kind of modern PET imaging that one can achieve. And Richard has been doing exactly what I said we need to do, and that is to get out there and, and show the potential of, of PET uh, to the cardiologists and also to the, to the internists to uh, grow the, the interest in the field. And he's been very successful in doing that. That's great. Shadi? Great, so Dr. Bernon, taking you to the second question. Um, you know, more, more recently, ASNIC has adopted and championed uh, a patient first initiative by focusing on performing uh, the right test at the right time for the right patient. So as a, as a founding member of ASNIC, what are your thoughts about the rules and actions that do you think ASNIC should play to help the promoting uh, the appropriate patient-focused imaging? Yeah, uh, great question, Shadi. Um, I, I think uh, ASNIC can play an important role here. I mean, I. I I'm a general cardiologist. Uh, uh, I do I do imaging, but I also send many patients for echocardiograms, uh, CT, and MRI as well. And so, uh, you know, I'm a, multi I'm a multimodality player in terms of my referrals for pa of patients to different techniques. So. Um, there's, there's not a one size fits all approach here. You have to choose the, the right test for the right patient. Um, I still think that uh, nuclear cardiology is uh, well equipped to address really important issues uh, for coronary artery disease in terms of its sensitivity. Um, and so it's kind of my go-to modality when I have a, a, a new patient where I want to make a, a, a diagnosis of a possible coronary disease um, based upon you know, risk factors and clinical presentation. Um, I, I, so I, I, it, would be my, it would be the test I would choose. And I think we need to keep pushing the, the, uh, the data regarding the uh, uh, diagnostic sensitivity of nuclear perfusion imaging. And then also the prognostic uh, data that are uh, so powerful uh, that uh, in addition to getting diagnostic information, we are uh, having built-in information regarding the prognostic potential and you know, which patients would we uh, continue to manage uh, medically, even if they have evidence of ischemia versus which patients would be candidates for intervention. Um, on the other hand, I see many other patients where uh, the issue comes up many times about, uh, should we, do we want functional data or do we want anatomic data? And so there are some patients for me where I might go to a CT scan, a CTA, to get the information regarding the anatomy, uh, and realizing with that, I'm not I'm not able to evaluate uh, how patients look on a treadmill. What 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 are their what's their symptomatic status? Uh, what what's their left ventricular um, uh, function and perfusion uh, data at, at the onset of, of possible symptoms. And so you know you have to choose the the tools to kind of match the patient, and um, uh, you know. There's also, you know, patients with valve disease and so forth, where uh, you know, echocardiography, MRI, become really important for me as well. Um, so it, it really depends upon the practice one has and which which your which your patient uh, uh, constellation look like. Uh, for me, uh, uh, nuclear perfusion imaging is kind of the go-to modality when I'm dealing with a patient for ischemia evaluation. Very right. nice. I yeah. think with, with that, we sort of uh, pivot to what our, our next topic was going to be, which was really, we were focused on you know, over the past decade, these combined imaging modalities have evolved to achieve better diagnosis and, and therapeutic outcomes. And really wanted to talk about sort of 
How do you see in the future hybrid imaging adding value or, or further fostering, you know, nuclear cardiology and clinical practice? I can speak from our, you know, my perspective uh, in the education committee, but also in ASNIC, we have these discussions, I think, to keep our, um, you know, members current is you have to think about some of these hybrid modalities and we can't just be, um, you know, laser focused only on the nuclear aspects, but you think about how CT comes into play and then making sure that our, you know, cardiologists have the right education to be able to, to, to interpret all of these studies. Well, that's a, that's a challenge too. Um, for example, if we're talking about, um, you know, PET and the potential for PET, because they're there, you, you can do the kind of hybrid imaging that we've been discussing. I mean, expense is an issue and we're not going to be able to do every test in every patient, you know, to do a, a PET image here and then bring the patient back for a, a CT, um, you know, or, or echocardiography. Uh, having, having a, uh, a, a platform where you can provide some hybrid data uh, in terms of uh, you know, calcium scoring, perfusion, function, I think would, would be quite powerful. Now, how, how do you get uh, a workforce that is well-trained in, in this uh, is kind of an issue because you know, not every center has the kind of pet capabilities that uh, we are hoping to achieve. And therefore not every cardiology trainee is going to be exposed to this where every cardiology trainee is exposed to echocardiography and perhaps SPECT imaging. Um, and so to evolve the field to the kind of advanced imaging that is now achievable, uh, it's gonna be a challenge because uh, we have to have enough centers uh, available to uh, provide the uh, educational um, uh, needs for the next generation of nuclear cardiologists. I think that's a challenge for ASNIC. So yeah, with this answer, I think it takes you to the next question. So we know that was was the was the recent approval of targeted breakthrough therapies and imaging uh, advances. Cardiac amyloidosis, specifically, uh, uh, which once was untreatable, has gained high attention in in the last few years. And radionuclide imaging is playing a really crucial role in in evaluation and management of patients with cardiac amyloidosis, is particularly the most common form of amyloidosis, cardiac transthyretine. So to what extent do you think has nuclear imaging uh, revolutionized our ability to, um, to specifically and non-invasively uh, uh, diagnose ATTR? Yeah, well, I think this gets back to the earlier discussion we had about the, um, uh, how the field evolves and stays current with the uh, uh, evolution of cardiology practice in general. And so being uh, facile and being able to uh, identify unique aspects of nuclear cardiology when we have uh, new therapies, uh, uh, important patient groups who previously uh, you know, were, were below the radar screen uh, suddenly pop up as, a, as an opportunity, but also um, you know, uh, a way of providing uh, uh, diagnostic data that can lead to major therapeutic uh, uh, options for patients. And so here, this is a great example of how amyloidosis now is a, a disease where the diagnosis becomes critical because we've got some therapeutic uh, um, options that previously were not available. And therefore it was below the radar. And, and now it's, it's right there in front of us. So you know, the ability to do uh, 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 um, amyloidosis evaluations with uh, nuclear cardiology is kind of a unique opportunity uh, for us as a field and also for our patients. And I think you could find other examples of that too, uh, other forms of uh, inflammatory disease, um, uh, myocarditis, um, uh, sarcoidosis, other, other uh, diseases where uh, the ability to uh, assess myocardial inflammation, uh, myocardial scar, becomes uh, you know very important uh, in our uh, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uh, procedures. Yeah, I think it's really you know enhanced uh, opportunities in nuclear cardiology and and certainly even created you know new uh, educational opportunities. I know uh, you know at our institution you talked about local leadership and uh, you know Prem Soman who leads our program now have a amyloidosis fellow who actually is you know involved in clinical and research efforts. So. Uh, I think really has expanded uh, opportunities in, in nuclear cardiology. 
Yeah, and it gets back to the issue also of, of having the uh, nuclear cardiology leadership at the local level fully integrated into the, the, the clinical operations of the institution. And you know, who, who are the other individuals there who are not the cardiologists, but are seeing patients with uh, uh, diseases where um, uh, they have the patients, uh, do they know that we have the expertise to help them in the management of their patients? And so how well are, are the uh, nuclear cardiologists uh, fully integrated into the, uh, the clinical um, uh, uh, workforce. So as we sort of close up this initial interview, just wanted to get your thoughts on so what do you see as sort of the next frontier in nuclear cardiology in terms of, um, you know, any new technologies or goals that you would have, you know, for uh, ASNIC or, or nuclear cardiology and any challenge, you know, major challenges that you see? I'm sure there's a broad question, but any anything specific come to mind? Well, I think one of the major challenges is uh, knowing when we have the right tool, the right right test for the right patient. Uh, that, that's one because there are other um, imaging modalities that are available to answer some of the same questions. Um, in, in some cases, maybe even uh, better than you can do with nuclear cardiology uh, alone. Um, but I think one of the major challenges is how do we make this cost effective as well? Uh, pet, pet, if we're talking about moving PET to the uh, uh, front burner uh, at more institutions, okay, uh, how do we make that cost effective and how do we get effective reimbursement for our procedures? This takes some work also uh, to, to uh, talk about patient flow, um, um, uh, how, how do we uh, obtain the right tracers, uh, how do we get the reimbursement from third parties and so forth. It's all doable, uh, but it does take some work and I think that's going to be a challenge going forward. The, the other challenge going forward is to uh, maintain uh, a, a prominent uh, feature here where we remain pertinent uh, and uh, uh, reliable uh, for the, uh, the general cardiologists and the internists to refer patients for testing and to make sure that we are providing the right education for them uh, to that, that they recognize uh, what we can provide for them to provide better care for their patients. I agree. I was as I was listening to your your comments. I think that's an important point: is education not only for the cardiologists but really for our referring physicians, because ultimately, you know, many of these physicians are who are going to be ordering these tests or who's seeing these patients initially before they reach a cardiologist. And yeah. so if they're not aware of either what our capabilities are or what, what the options might be, um, they might not think about these things. And in fact, when they see somebody get a test and they get a report, they might not know exactly what it means. So I think, you know, providing more education, you know, throughout your hospital or health system is important. Yeah. And getting back to the reports, I think uh, being, being uh, facile uh, in the reporting is also quite important make sure that we're communicating well to the referring doctors to uh, uh, allow them to, to see what the potential is for nuclear cardiology for their next patients. And I can speak to uh, at least our institution. That's one of the, the main efforts that we've made is to try to make our reports, whether it be for nuclear cardiology or echocardiography or other, um, you know, to be succinct in areas so that at least referring providers who might not be knowledgeable in all aspects of the report can get the information they need and know what they're looking for. Yeah. And I think that that can be very helpful. Yeah. And, and it, it's always helpful to pick up the phone and call the referring doc when you've got something really important uh, that you've identified in that patient. Uh, that's, that tends to seal the deal many times in getting uh, uh, the, the educational value as well as the uh, uh, collegial relationship with referring doctors where they will continue to refer your patients. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us today. This is really a great first interview and it was uh, certainly a pleasure and uh, an honor to be able to, to interview with you today. And um, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully uh, uh, other time soon. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Shadi. Great to see you and uh, uh, keep up the good work at Destin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.